Friday evening, October 8th, 2021. I have just finished reading an amazing book by Wendell Berry, Harlan Hubbard, Life and Work. And I am really touched by Wendell's writing of this man, Harlan, and his wife, Anna, and the life that they created together. And I'm here to just share some of the photographs from this book with you. And whilst I'm doing that, to read some passages from this book. It's so important right now. I really needed this time to read and to reconnect with people who were living at a time when things were already being becoming complicated and they were looking for a way to simplify and stay in touch with themselves and with earth. The great danger, Harlan thought, is unconsciousness of the particularity of our earthly whereabouts, an unconsciousness that is dangerous both to humanity and to the world. So the quotations now are Harlan. A man should be terror struck in viewing the abyss, the void about him, and yet the sky is only a higher ceiling. More amazing is his indifference to the earth on which he lives a groveling life. Its radiant beauty should be an unending source of wonder and joy. Yet most people live and die without noticing it. Quotation. And he wrote later, reiterating his fear of the reduction of human being to mind and of things to ideas. Quotation. The danger is to see and hear with the intellect instead of the senses, or rather with the intellect alone instead of the intellect through the senses. Nothing is more perishable than our relation with the earth. It must be constantly renewed. Come in a house, think of something else, become absorbed in some work, and it's gone. Quotation. And he meant not just the physical earth itself, but also the sanctity and blessedness of it, the everlasting goodness and harmony that is present in it. He spoke of light as a blessing and an unaccountable blessing given to us every day, though we receive it thoughtlessly. He refused the dualism that disassociates eternal light from daily light, just as he refused to divide here from hereafter. Quotation. Perhaps the four last things still rule, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Only these are in force during life. If one perseveres, the consciousness of the world is faithful enough and graced enough and pays enough attention, then there will be times when this world reveals itself as the other world. On October 17, 1963, Harland wrote, this continued fair warm weather and the ripening of the earth affords a glimpse of life on a higher level than we know. It is marvelous that our daily lives go on amid this splendor. No heaven could be more fair. In another place in his journal, he writes, I watch the fireflies as I look down into the bottomland like a basin in its wall of dark trees all filled with a flashing moving light. Their wild dance suggests the supernatural the scientist would explain it probably as the mating of insects, but how would he account for the joy it raises in the beholder? That is the supernatural part, and it can't be explained away. It is more real than the scientific fact. 
Harlan unified and simplified his life and character, principally by reuniting in his own life many of the modern divisions of labor. The list of disciplines in which he acquired at least competence and sometimes mastery is remarkable not only for its length, but for its integrity. He learned them all because all were, in one way or another, necessary to his life. Not one was a hobby or a sideline. He knew and practiced the arts of carpentry, masonry, gardening, goat husbandry, beekeeping, woodcutting, fishing, river navigation, drawing, painting, printmaking, music, made, music making, writing. There appears then to be an inescapable conflict unsuspected by Thoreau, and Thoreau is one of um, the authors that Harlan uh, really enjoyed. Unsuspected by Thoreau, between following the bent of one's genius at every moment and achieving a considerable measure of simplicity and independence. It is hard to come to exact conclusions about the differences between the economies of Walden Pond and Payne Hollow, which is um, the name of the place where Harlan and Anna lived. For too many variants of history, circumstance, and character are involved. It is certain that Thoreau's account of his economy shows an impulse toward austerity and that no such impulse is in the account from Payne Hollow. In one of Harlan's journal entries, he says, I am advised to abandon these lovely hand tools whose efficiency has evolved through many generations of users and to do my garden work with a polychrome shiny gadget which is without character and to me very objectionable, being noisy, evil smelling and undependable. To think of choosing to have such a contraption between me and the soil blotting out the song of birds and the sweet sound of the river and the sweet fragrances of spring. It would mean loss of independence because gasoline has to be bought out for it from in town. And if it needs repairs, a specialist must be called in. The cost is considerable too. And the acquiring, the acquiring of money is slavery for me. Further into the book, Wendell Berry uh, writes about Harlan's uh, painting career uh, as an artist. And he says, it is clear from his paintings and writings alike that Harlan loved these little farms of the hill country south of the Ohio River in the era before World War II. He spoke of it as the, quote, high sweet farmland, quote. The farming practice there in those days, as the paintings show, was of a small scale and was highly diversified, dependent for power upon the bodies of people, horses, and mules. The farmers, though not affluent, were independent, self-sufficient, and possessed, Harlan wrote, of the skills and strength and endurance the patience and repose needed for long continued work. He loved their houses whose simple dignity and beautiful proportions make them an adornment to the landscape. This farming at its best, and it was not always at its best, was very good. In its small scale, its diversity and its extensive dependence upon grass and grazing it was conservation of the land and it supported a way of life that was in many ways calmly and pleasing. It had remained unchanged in its essentials for several generations before World War II and the industrialization that followed brought it to an end. These farms appealed to Harlan because they belonged to or at least suggested a human economy that was properly scaled and proportioned to the countryside that supported it. In a statement prepared for a show of his work at Appalachian Spring, an art gallery in Fort Thomas, Kentucky, Harlan spoke of the countryside around Fort Thomas 
at the time of his boyhood as having revealed to him a sort of vision of the life of man in harmony with nature, a brief flowering between the primeval wilderness that was gone and the urban blight that was to come. So this was a vision that became historically more remote as he grew older. He never forgot it, and he remained consciously under its influence. In his book, Pain Hollow, Harlan wrote of his love of rural landscapes that showed the effect of men's innocent work, an innocence lost by the time of his and Anna's return to Kentucky 20 years later. In 1953, he writes, Quote, the dignity and grace of farming steadily vanishes, quote. And 10 years later, he saw that the change had occurred in both the land and the people, and it was profound. He writes, the countryside grows less and less beautiful and interesting, less country. The old country houses are being replaced by wooden boxes, which do not fit in the landscape. And somehow the machine grown crops have little character the strain, unrest, and dissatisfaction of the people shows up in the appearance of the countryside. Quote. Wendell continues. Harlan saw that to live, he had to earn his life from the earth, either by his own work or by somebody else's. He chose to live by his own work, and he enjoyed doing so. That, I think, is why his paintings are not scenes the world is not scenery to anyone who has work to do in it. In Harlan's paintings, we are not looking at beautiful landscapes that are scenic or merely pleasing or beautiful. We are looking at earthly places that have been carefully understood both in themselves and in relation to their human inhabitants. Anna died in May of 1986 and Harlan died in January of 1988. The paramount historical significance of the Hubbard's life is that they lived and thrived in a place in which, by the conventional assumptions of our time, all human possibilities were exhausted. When they settled at Payne Hollow, the place had been abandoned but a stone chimney, a root cellar, and some other relics testified to a life that had been lived there once and was given up. The place was available to the Hubbards because no one saw any good in it. Such a life can be dismissed as inconsequential only by those who refuse to see the overriding irony of our present economic life, that growth is inescapably shrinking us we are living within ever widening margins of abandoned, abused or despised or ruined land. The fringes of our society, which our children will have to inhabit and make the best of if they can. And they must either make the best of them as Harlan and Anna did by poverty of means, by great skill, by love or endure them at their worst. This book uh, was published in 1990 um, through the University Press of Kentucky. I hope that you enjoyed this and looking at some of the photographs of the paintings of Harlan's work, um, as well as some of the photographs um, of his and Anna's life um, at their place called Pain Hollow.